Uh, we are going to talk now about uh, voice user interfaces. Thanks for joining my session, actually. Quite a lot of people here. Um, just a heads up, we are not, uh, will not be demonstrating a lot of code. We will be merely f uh, primarily focusing on the ecosystem, uh, performance, and that kind of stuff. So, as I was already introduced, my name is Roland Tiefenbrunner. I'm from Austria. I started developing Alexa skills one and a half years ago when they actually, when the devices were published in the German speaking market. Currently, we are also trying, or trying, well, we are actually quite uh, migrating them to other systems like Google Home for the uh, Google Assistant, uh, Microsoft Cortana, and so on. Uh, we published several skills. It's, uh, I think, eight. And we're serving in the German-speaking market right now 100,000 uh, unique users. That means roughly 3 million requests per month. And just as a comparison, uh, Nick Schwab, the founder of Invoked Apps, is also an Alexa champion and started to develop in 2015. He actually um, published his numbers in December and he was serving 2 million unique users uh, in December only. So there's actually quite a huge potential in this market. So, what are we going to talk about? Well, first I want to show you what's uh, possible these days. I want to show you how you can get uh, actually involved. Then I will give a broad overview of the speech recognition pipeline, the components, and then we really go do a deep dive in the Alexa, uh, in one of my Alexa skills. And then afterwards, we will talk about the learning and uh, improvements you can do there. So, market situation. Well, the big companies like Google, Amazon, and so on are actually quite pushing this whole topic. I'm actually quite astonished that they are not more present here in this, uh, on this conference. I mean, the whole voice topic in general, uh, or the assistance. Furthermore, IBM joined uh, this topic a long time ago. Microsoft Cortana, they're actually quite, uh, doing quite well. And I also wanted to give a shout out for Snipes. Uh, it's a rather small company from the US. And their focus is mainly on privacy. They also have the speech recognition part, the natural language understanding part, and they actually open source their stuff. So um, you can check, check it out. Well, it all started with the assistants, like um, I think Amazon was the first one, 2015. Uh, currently, it's all about still the smart speakers. Uh, I don't know if you actually followed the, the news, more or less, in this area. And I think next year, we will also be talking to our coffee machines. We will be talking to our cars and to our refrigerators. I have really no idea what a conversation with a refrigerator is like, but we will find out uh, soon. So, and this actually, these numbers don't include uh, mobile phones. So yeah, those are uh, quite approximately, will be a lot of new devices, new products that will include um, the voice user interface and assistance. Uh, we also saw it for one of our early skills. Uh, it's called Would You Rather. It's a simple uh, language game. Uh, it was one of the first skills and it was first promoted by Amazon in August last year. And then we got another promotion in uh, September, uh, in December. And there you saw that actually a lot of new people bought an Amazon Echo at their home and that there are a lot of people joining. Furthermore, you have to know that there was a, uh, a survey done by VoiceBot and they found out that actually just 50% of the smart speak owners um, know that there exists third-party apps. Okay, so half of the people actually don't use uh, third-party skills at all. That means there is still even more potential. Actually, a question I forgot to ask. How many of you guys do actually have one? Yeah, that's okay-ish. Not that many yet. Um, yeah. The main problem we have with in this ecosystem right now is user acquisition and discoverability of skills. 
there I have a kind of comparison between two skills of us, one that has got highly promoted or intensively promoted from Amazon, and the other one, not at all. So the spike was here with 100 users, and now it's actually just a zombie skill. And the other one is like aggressively promoted with newsletters, banners, and whatsoever. And you really can see um, the difference between those two skills. But it's a, a huge problem, and we haven't figured it out yet. People trying to approach it differently. Um, one is trying to create some sort of network where you can promote skills. However, Amazon, for example, is really, uh, really don't want any advertisement within their apps. There was actually one startup which closed this year. They wanted to give use or give developers the possibility to play ads, but Amazon just shut them off immediately when they heard about it. Uh, so, yeah, discoverability is actually quite a problem at the moment if you're not promoted by Amazon. Yeah. So, opportunities for you guys. Um, of course, there are um, mm, like APIs for in-app purchases, like with mobile apps. Uh, Alexa actually, or Amazon just launched it like one month ago. Google Home, I think, already had, have it, has it since one year. Um, but furthermore, they're investing actually a lot of money in terms of developer rewards. Amazon, for example, has this developer reward program, and they started it in June. And the, f or the first contacted, uh, contacted us in June, and there you have the possibility if you have a skill that gets a lot of traction, has a lot of unique users, and actually a high engagement, then you can earn money. So they will tell you in the middle of the month if you, if you had enough usage last year, uh, last month, and then you can get like $200 or up to $5,000. Uh, there was even, I think, the I think it, I don't know who it was, but one of the developers actually earned through this $100,000 uh, last year. The problem is, it's not, you can't be, really build a sustainable business model on this kind of stuff, because Amazon maybe pays you, Amazon maybe doesn't. Uh, yeah, for Mike's uh, skills example, for example, we got a lot of payment during November, December, and now it's actually flattening again. So yeah, not sustainable at all or not predictable at all, at least. Uh, furthermore, they have a lot of competitions. Right now, there is the life hack challenge for uh, Amazon. The winners can get between $5,000 and $20,000. So I actually recommend to try that out com uh, and commit a skill. And furthermore, yeah, different kinds of prices. And Google Assistant or Google has not the same strategy. They are actually trying to build a sustainable ecosystem and they focus more on, on startups and invest in startups that build up on the Google Assistant. So quite a lot of opportunities actually. Uh, if you build these kinds of skills, actions and so forth, you can actually also get credits for Google App Engine or the AWS. So you don't have to pay for the whole infrastructure either. Right. Uh, technical pipeline, like in a <laughs> broad, very broad uh, view. How does it work? First, uh, the sentence like Alexa, uh, I want a table for three people tomorrow at noon. First, there is the hot, hot word detection or wake word. That means the smart speaker actually has to know that you're talking to it. So for Alexa, it's yeah, obviously Alexa or computer or Echo. For Google Home, it's OK Google or Hey Google. And then afterwards, the text is recorded, sent to the cloud, and then the first part is the speech recognition. That means we have to figure out somehow what the user actually said, so we need some <coughs> text. And if we, if we have done that, then we can actually process this text and try to find out what the user actually said. That's the, actually also used by chatbots, the same pipeline. I mean, for the natural language understanding part. So I was curious how well we are doing in that area, actually. So um, automatic speech recognition is quite good at the moment, actually. It, the performance increased very dramatically in 2010. 
uh, that were, was the time when the first papers were released using deep neural networks for um, tackling these kinds of problems. So uh, automatic speech recognition has different, par different parts like um, creating acoustic features, uh, creating uh, the acoustic model, the language model, and they tried deep neural networks for each part of those. And you can see actually for Nuance, it's a company since, uh, it's around since 20 years, and it's like writing notes and that stuff, kind of stuff. And their performance increased uh, quite well during this time. And Google claimed that they now have roughly word error rate of 5% for the English language. Uh, but I think that's in the best kind of case, you know. Um, furthermore, it's quite difficult to compare different the, the companies because everyone uses their own data set. Google, for example, I saw in a, in a paper that they use the voice search queries. Trans, uh, transcribes them, and then afterwards using YouTube videos to add additional noise and that kind of stuff, and then they train them, the model or their, yeah, their system with it. And they definitely use a different approach than Amazon, for example. Um, so it's quite hard to, to compare it and like, to make a real comparison between them. So we just have to believe Google, yeah, we have now uh, 5% error rate in English. You can actually ask them at their booth, maybe they know. Um, yeah, and then afterwards we have transcribed the text successfully. We need to know what the user actually wants from us, right? So in this case, he wants to book a table, but this also has to work if we say something different, something like, I need a reservation, book me a reservation, or whatever comes to your mind. Okay, and we have to actually extract the data we need. In this, in this case, we want to know when actually and for how many people. So, uh, in the terms that are used here is on one side the, the intent that describes the, the, uh, the intent of the user, what the user actually wants from, yourself, uh, from your system, and then furthermore you have slots or entities um, so further data that is extracted actually from, uh, from this sentence, okay? And you, it's actually quite like variables, and those variables or the value of these variables is then passed to your web service or to your app. And Snipes, the company I just uh, mentioned before, they made quite an interesting benchmark actually. They compared uh, all the big vendors and what they did, they created a huge data set um, for seven kinds of intents. So we had a booking intent, we had a music intent, so where you can search for music. And for each intent, they created 2,000 queries. Some of the data they used for uh, teaching the system, and the rest of the data they used for verification, if, uh, validation. And then they compared each of these systems um, and this is API, it's the former name for Dialogflow uh, from Google. They were actually a startup and was Google, uh, bought by Google. Uh, Louis AI is from Microsoft, with AI is from Facebook, and Amazon Alexa. Right, and so what they checked for is, is actually the right intent called? So did the system actually realize what we want from it? And if it has the right intent, was it also able to extract uh, the right data? And, yeah, actually, I think, I don't know, I was expecting a bit more, to be honest. Um, but still, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite good. Um, so what they did, they averaged the, on one side, the precision, meaning did we get the right intent, uh, and how well was the data precision, uh, the extraction. And then they just took the medium and calculated the F1 score for each of the system. And then I got curious, actually. I wanted to know how does it work for uh, one of our skills? How well do we understand the user, and how often do we actually have to say, sorry, I did not understand you? And as an example, we'll talk uh, one of the casual games uh, we developed. It's a rather very easy um, language game. Alexa asks you a question, would you rather be a Jedi or a Sith? And then you answer, like, 
whatever is your choice, and you get you get a, like a silly response. Plus, you will get to know how many people answered the same way. Even though it's quite an easy example or an easy skill, it's uh, quite interesting in terms of um, processing the data because we are really working like not with numbers like one, two, three, but we have natural text, and we need to map that text to our options. So we, we use that skill for um, trying that out. Just a rough overview for people who don't know how it like, yeah, kind of works. So you talk with your echo device. I would rather be a Sith, obviously. And this audio is then sent to the Alexa cloud. There we have the speech recognition part. There we have the natural language understanding part. And then they actually call your web service. Um, it's just JSON. You get JSON, you send back JSON. And there they, they tell you which intent the user or the system thinks the user wants to, to call and the value of this text. And then you get it, and then you, you do whatever you want to do with it, right? Uh, furthermore, we have the, the dev portal. There you can actually create, the com or there you have the, the configuration, like what is the URL of your endpoint. And furthermore, you define your voice model. Uh, a voice model looks something like that. As an example for the answer intent, so the answer intent is the one that should be called when the user gives the an answer to Alexa. And utterances would be something like, yeah, I would rather, uh, definitely, of course, that is easy, I want, or just, just the, the answer itself. So then we define our slot. Within our slot, we provide a value for each option we have in our system. So we have roughly like, uh, three, 325 questions with two options, and each option is represented as a value there. Furthermore, you can be even more uh, fine granular. You can actually add synonyms. So a user might not just say be a Jedi, but only Jedi, and so on. And this is actually quite important, as you will see later, um, because based on these values, Alexa might actually call it different or understand a different intent. Uh, so being there quite precise or creative is actually quite important. So, yeah, we have roughly 40 utterances. The more, the better here. Um, recommended is 70. 70. But yeah, it's quite hard actually at the very beginning to come up with that many. And then we have roughly 640, uh, 50 slots and additional 1,800 synonyms. So intent mapping. So when you start the game, the Alexa asks you which, which uh, edition you actually want to play. Do you want to play the Harry Potter or the standard edition? And what we would expect is actually the game mode intent, you know, because we have a different utterance for that and we have a different slot values for that. So we would expect the system um, to give us the game mode intent, so in terms of our internal state of the application. But what could happen is uh, that the user doesn't pro pronounce it the way we're supposed to, or uh, Alexa doesn't understand that well whatsoever, and actually a different intent is called. So be prepared for that. Uh, unfortunately, it's quite hard to, to calculate the error rate here. Uh, because you don't have all the data that is in terms of what the users actually said. You just have some uh, insight on that, but not all of them. So what we've just found out that the game mode intent, we had like roughly a 10% um, error rate. So it was falsely called or extracted. And then we have the slot value mapping. That means we... The user says, gives an answer, and then we have then the framework extracts the slot value, and then furthermore, we have actually to map them to our options. The user can, of course, say different kinds of words. Sometimes Alexa completely uh, doesn't understand it or matches to something wrong because it sounds similar, and you always have to, um, to, to be prepared for that. There, we actually had an error rate of 25%. 
and it was quite, yeah, not so. I don't think it's a quite a good user experience if every fourth and or every fourth after every fourth answer that the system asks you, sorry, I did not understand that. Can you repeat that? That's actually quite um, annoying, yeah. And so we started to dig deeper, actually. So we extracted like 300,000 data points uh, and see how our matching went. <coughs> and some of the finding, at least it seems like users are pretty, um, how to say, lazy. They don't use a lot of words. They don't use a lot of, yeah, a lot of words to interact with your system. So they used just like, 25% used more than, used the word like I would rather or something like that, and 65% or 60% uh, just used um, maximum, uh, one or two words. Furthermore, we also saw that the, unfortunately the matching rate for one word answers was quite bad actually. So we have 50% match rate, it's like guessing, so we could like just say whatever, like uh, not really good. It actually increases quite far. Um, but as we saw here, users are lazy, and unfortunately, uh, this means we are more in that uh, matching rate. And we dig a bit further, and there we saw actually that the longer the question, that was actually quite interesting, the longer the questions, the more words the, que the, more words the question had, or the answers, uh, the worse it, it got, actually. So the more complex or the yeah, complicated our question is, uh, the more the user struggles with answering it, or at least the system itself to, to catch an appropriate answer. So, okay, now I told you everything, like the error rate of the speech recognition system, 5%. We have the natural language understanding with, yeah, of a match rate from 55, and our skill is a uh, match rate of, or fail rate of 25. Why does it matter? Who cares, right? Um, why we should care? Actually, this was a, a talk from the Google I.O. last year, where they shared a survey. And there it says, which makes sense actually, that people get quite annoyed when the system doesn't understand it. So most of the people, some of them don't care, uh, but many of, many of them do, which makes sense because just imagine when you're talking to your buddy and he's asking you twice, um, what do you say, what do you say? And it's like not the best experience, right? It also is reflected in your um, ratings. We always experiment with our voice model with different approaches. Furthermore, um, Amazon itself is actually trying out uh, tweaking their systems. And yeah, that can happen, obviously. So this would be the reasons why you should care about your um, <coughs> about the user experience, because really people obviously do care about it, right? So, uh, improvements, what you can do. Actually, what I really, or what we actually really ignored was the voice model at the very beginning. So the major part we talked about, uh, we just like wrote two utterances and some slot values and then just said, yeah, Alexa, do the stuff. Uh, and actually there is more to it, and you should actually invest quite a lot of time uh, because it really helps, it really improves your system. There are different uh, approaches you can take here. Which is new for Alexa, and Google has it already since the beginning, I think, that you have access to the raw data, raw data to see what the system actually understood or what the user actually said. And there you can actually find out that people are really using creative ways of communicating with your skill. For one, we actually had a 32-word long answer because he was watching TV and it was just transcribing everything the TV said, actually. So, so, so it's really funny, actually. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, observe users. It's like, like for every product, like if you're building an app, you're building a website whatsoever, observe the users. 
um, observe them while using your skill. And you will see, like in this example, at the very beginning, I tried to implement funny phrases when the system didn't understand you, and people were just so annoyed. Like, just make it like short, uh, and everything is fine. Furthermore, uh, for Alexa, we have the entity resolutions, if you look it up. Um, they tell you actually when they can't map your input to, a, to one of your slots. So, also use that to improve. And also since, I think, two weeks, we have the fallback intents with uh, Amazon. Um, this is called when the precision is not that high or not, not that confident. Then they, you can actually define a fallback intent that should be called. And then you can give appropriate answer to the user. Google has the same since the very beginning, I think. Uh, in your endpoint, um, watch out for wrong intents, meaning actually, in general, your whole application is stateless. Um, therefore, you should take care of yourself in terms of when you have defined a certain flow, like for example, in our case, we have first the game mode intent and then afterwards the answer intent should be started, right? And then, therefore, you should actually take care about that in your apps to make it more robust, resilient. And what's quite interesting, fuzziness is kind of different in voice than it is for um, web or mobile or written, because in voice there are no spelling mistakes. In voice there is just words that sound similar, right? Um, so what we implemented actually was the Soundex uh, algorithm, because there is a German version for that one. Um, it's already developed in the 60s. And there you have the, um, the algorithm itself just takes uh, a word and then uh, decodes it, in this case, to, uh, to, to letters and numbers. And thereby you can actually have three words, for example, that sound the same, are written differently, but have the same representation. Right? And then on that level you can actually do the fuzziness, the fuzzy logic. Yeah, and it's just fuzziness according to use case, because in our, in our case we had like, it's a casual game where the user shouldn't ask the system like, or the, the, the system should ask the users 10 times, like, what did you say, what did you say? Be a bit more optimistic in this case, right? So we also have a lot of false positives, but it may be a user, better user experience. Uh, design, you actually can improve a lot um, with voice design. The interesting part about this one is that we are like really at the beginning. There is not much uh, literature around in that case, or in that area. Uh, even though voice systems are used uh, since several years, but still, uh, yeah, like not much literature available. Um, so, what definitely works out is creating a reprompt strategy. That means how do you react every time you didn't understand something. And in the first level, I really recommend being actually quite rapid, so having a short answer uh, or a short reprompt so the user doesn't get annoyed too much. That's the problem with um, the voice user interface in general, that it steals the user's time, because you always have to listen to the whole sentence, wait until it's finished, and then afterwards you can respond. So that's the problem with the whole architecture right now, with a command, response, command, response. Uh, therefore, keep it quite short. Uh, and in the second level, we just decided in our use case that we just skip the question because the, the whole app is about providing like, funny content and it doesn't make sense when you have two options that you ask the user ten, ten, uh, ten times, uh, what did you say? Furthermore, I recommend actually the the design guide from Google. Um, they have really good examples and really uh, demonstrate how you actually can react to certain use cases and how you actually should build it. And yeah, in our case, we just skip after the second turn. So we just presume to the next, um, next question. Furthermore, like with code, Keep it short, 
Um, that's actually something I think every voice app developer will tell you. At the moment, just try to keep your output short and simple. You saw that in also in the data that when we had like short questions with short answers, the match rate was quite well. It was between 80 and 90 percent. So it's good enough. And furthermore, analyze and optimize. That meaning we are actually storing every answer and every match rate. And we found out that we had one question that had a fail rate of 70 percent. So we just threw it out because. We didn't actually know why, but it was quite long, actually, and maybe that, that's the reason why. And what we're going to try out, I think, starting next week, that we calculate like a short amount of break after asking the question before the system starts to listen. Because we think, so that's like an hypothesis based on the data, um, that the longer the question, the, the longer the user needs to process it, which would make sense, right? And therefore, the longer it is, the, the longer break will be and the more time he will have to answer. So we'll try that out. So that's about it, actually. Uh, summed up, yeah, we talked about the market. I really recommend uh, starting to develop voice apps, especially in the German-speaking market. There are not that many people um, doing it right now. We are quite early stage. So uh, German-speaking market, yeah, one and a half years. Uh, in general, in total, it's like um, three years. There are always new features, always uh, new technology, always new, way, new, new ways how you can contribute, and there's also possibilities of making some money. Furthermore, I highly recommend or a shout out for the Amazon Alexa Slack group. They are really active. Um, it's the biggest one right now. There's also one for Google. Um, if you have any questions, of course, now afterwards, but anyways, you will find me there. And please just uh, write me some lines and I will be happy to help you out, um, as the other folks there did. So there are quite experienced developers, Nick Schwab is hanging out there, and, and a lot of other guys. Furthermore, you can also write me an email or just uh, find me on Twitter. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice last day. There, there are questions in Slido, and we would be happy if you would sure. answer them right now. They will show up in front of you, and it's up to your choice to answer them. Uh, the first one, is it possible to get the whole um, audio file or text sentence of a user? Not of a certain user, it is anonymized. Um, I'm not sure if you get the audio file. I think for, at least for Alexa, it's just possible to get a t transcribed text. Um, they introduced this feature like two weeks ago. Um, for Google, they always had it. Um, but I'm not sure about the, I don't think that's actually no the audio. That would be in terms of privacy, I don't think so, no. Is, that, is the question answered? Um, is it possible to develop a good Alexa skill for a language you don't know? Um, tough one, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of, I mean, I think there were some people actually in the Slack group who, uh, who wanted to join the French market. I think they released it like a couple of months ago and tried to use the um, Google Translator. But as far as I know, it didn't go that well. But maybe you find someone who can, who can work with you. Um, you can ask in the, in the Slack channels. Looking at the latest Google Assistant presentation, how far do you think are they ahead? Good question. I mean, if you saw the duplex demonstration, that's like uh, pretty impressive. Um, Technology-wise, I think Google is ahead, honestly. I do think that. Uh, but Amazon has like a real huge market share. I mean, they started the market and they own actually most of it. Some other companies are joining, but so technology-wise, I think, yes, they are actually ahead. Um, market share, no, at the moment, at least. I mean, they are growing still, but yeah. Maybe you mentioned also integration-wise, integrating against Google Home and against Alexa, there's a massive difference. 
Um, the question was if there is a difference between integrating Google Home and uh, Alexa into different devices, you mean? Or? No, I mean uh, writing Alexa skills ah, okay. and integrating with uh, Hey Google and custom um, I think that's based on your code, actually. If you, have, um, if you write an Alexa skill, for example, you have to implement like uh, just one specific endpoint. If you're abstracted, then you can just put in or plug in actually another endpoint for Google Home as well. So there is not that much difference because the, they are actually quite have the same structure within 10 slots. And furthermore, Dialogflow now supports, as I learned yesterday, actually building voice models for Alexa as well. So you can actually use one system for many. Does it answer? You can talk later if you want. Yeah. How do you get around GDPR? I don't think you have to because I don't have user data. So um, the only thing I get is a created user ID, and that is unique for user for skill. So when he, the user actually um, activates a different skill from mine, another skill from mine, uh, it doesn't even have the same ID. So I seriously don't know who is actually communicating or working with my um, skill. So I guess, I mean, I'm not a, definitely not an expert on GDPR, um, but I don't have any like real data, I don't have names or whatsoever, right? Uh, could you use machine learning on the recorded answers to improve the system and reduce the fail rate? Uh, maybe, but I mean, you don't have recorded answers, you just have text. Um, honestly, I don't know if it's like a big enough of a problem to, to use machine learning for. Um, you're so dependent on the underlying structure or the underlying components, what they provide um, data for you, if they understand like nonsense. And this was a lot of times actually that we really just had nonsense answers where did not fit in any way in the current, to the current context. So I honestly don't think machine learning is the right approach here. I mean, I'm not an expert, but... How do you authenticate the user on your backend? Um, um, how do you... Uh, depends on the use case. I mean, you have... A, uh, you have an API for that one. If you want to give the user the possibility to create an account with your app, then you actually can do that. Otherwise, you just use the, the small uh, the skill ID you got. Uh, but so far, we didn't authenticate the users at all, actually. So we just had the user ID and that we stored in the database. And whenever the same user came back, we just um, yeah um, searched for it. Uh, is it possible to mix German and English in one skill? Uh, yes, it is possible, actually. Um, it's just you get a, in, the, in the request from the Amazon framework, and I think Google as well, which make, would make sense, you get a local, uh, which language is actually like calling, or which language that the user, the language of the user. And then you can just say, OK, if it's German, get that response. If it's English, take that response. And it's just actually one, uh, one flag within your code at the very beginning. So that's definitely possible. Um, but you have, of course, to provide the output for both languages. I don't want my data, voice, etc. stored somewhere. I want my personal assistance based in my private cloud operating my private server at home. Snipes, uh, Snipe, uh, which I introduced at the very beginning. That's their main USP, actually, the privacy part, that you can just take their systems, put it in a Raspberry, put it wherever you want, phone, whatever, and you are totally 100% responsible for data and so on. So I would recommend this solution, actually. Where's the real opportunity for development on this ecosystem? The real opportunity. Uh, uh, well, in the German-speaking market, I think we will get started with the 
companies start to realize the potential of the systems. So you can always do like project kind of work. As I heard yesterday, Google is actually looking for partners, also in this area, Google Assistant partners. Um, and they will actually bring to you the, the project. So there is definitely an op opportunity that you find like companies and do projects for them. Um, otherwise, you can, you can leverage the monetization API uh, and charge for in-app purchases and so on. Last question. Last question. <laughs> if will I speak as Yoda, will correctly understand me? Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.